Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, let's begin with a silent prayer. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> this morning, what we're going to look at, if we just go to our board quickly, my last presentation, I was explaining about how between Midnight B and uh, the Chasm, you have these this statue rising represents these pagan kingdoms and you get down to the fourth kingdom and you have this this church and state which rules for 1260 years and in revelation 79 it explains to us that there's a woman been sitting upon these and how <clears throat> this is representing the, the 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 daily but this statue was typifying um, this work at the end of the world, the, the rise and fall of these last kingdoms and how this, this statue down to the feet and toes represents paganism and when you get to the, the, the feet and toes, the 1260 years represents papalism and in Revelation 13 you have represented this beast coming out of the sea in 538, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon symbolically representing and in John, in Revelation 17, he sees a woman sitting upon this beast. So you have the, the same representation, right, represented by paganism and papalism. It's showing you that it's the same power that's been um, trampling underfoot God's people. And this is what is in Daniel 8. How long shall the, uh, the daily and the transgression of desolation tread down God's people? So... Um, and we understand that at the chasm, character is revealed internally. Judas is revealed. And Judas is the son of perdition, who externally is the Pope. So we know that in Bible prophecy, when the Sunday law comes here, the woman is hidden. That's what we see with Jezebel. We see this with Herodias. But right here, it says, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. And he's revealed right here. Okay, this little horn, this papal horn, he gets revealed and he then persecutes for this, this time period. And we just have these two fractals here. We have our, our binding off. And here we have the Sunday law uh, to, to Midnight Sea, representing 1260 from the cross. But on a fractal level, this is down here. And you have two 1260 periods with the chasm in the middle as the cross. It's important that we see and understand that. And at the bottom here, we've laid on here the first and second woes from midnight B to the chasm where the second woe comes and, and so on and so forth. So that's the illustration there and we're going to use that now. We're going to talk about the ceiling. It's very important to understand this and, it, and it's very nice when you, when you have this understanding and you lay this on top, it, it, it comes together very, very nicely. So let's begin by reading a quote from the great Second Advent Movement. And one second. Um, and it's speaking about uh, the time period of 1848. <clears throat> and 1848, as we understand, uh, is prefiguring the Sunday law uh, right here when the shaking of the earth, shaking of the angry nations. And we'll speak about that as we go through. But it says, Just at this time, the Seventh-day Adventists were learning from the Scriptures that the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment was the sign or seal of the living God. And that the time had arrived for the proclamation of the sealing message of Revelation 10, 1-4. So it's recorded in history that in 1848, when this crisis arose, when these, all these nations were angry, 
that Adventists realized that it was the time for the sealing message. And it's paralleling the sealing message with Revelation 10, 1 to 4. Now, Revelation 10, Sister White parallels it with Revelation 18, 1 to 3. And Revelation 18, 1 to 3 is marked at midnight B, right? So, Revelation 18, 1 to 3 marks the beginning of the sealing message. Okay, and, and what we want to, to try and show now is that the, the sealing or the seal that you receive comes in, in two phases. Just like there is two temple cleansings, just like there is two births, right? It's exactly the same. The seal is showing you this exact same principle and, and we, we'll show you. So from this moment forward, Adventists back in 8048 understood that this is the time period where the, the sealing message goes uh, forward. Um, but there's just always two groups and it says and they were devising ways and means of getting this message before the people while the seventh day people were preparing for this work the first day Adventists were saying you are too late with your sealing message for the battle of the great day the Lord's actual coming is right upon us so you have a, a true message the sealing message and you have a false saying that Christ has already come right in some sense you're saying that this was the second coming of Christ so and that's what you have marked in Matthew 24 two groups one says that false Christ, Christ has come, and the other group saying, no way, be not deceived, it's, it's further forward, right? So it's important that we understand that. Now I just want to put a few things in place now, I want to put the time of the end in place. This is from Australian Union Conference record, April 15th, 1912. It says, we are living in the time of the end, right? We understand the time of the end is right here, let's just... Mark that on there. Time of the end. And we will confirm that as we go through this. We are living in the time of the end when the judgments of God are in the land. Signs on every hand show that the agencies of evil are strengthening. Lucifer and his servants are working with unceasing activity. In this time of peril, the people who keep the Sabbath of the fourth commandment are to be awake to the situation, prepared to resist the attacks of the enemy. While wickedness abounds on every hand, God's people are to be fully controlled by the Holy Spirit. Greater solemnity and earnestness should be brought into the work. All light and trifling words should be left unspoken. Believers should speak and act as a people who realize the solemn meaning of the events taking place. So, the time of the end... She says, we are living in the time of the end, and they know this because of the, they understand the events taking place, right? So we're going to look now at another quote and see what events has been spoken about. This is from Review and Herald, May the 13th, 1902. She begins with the same phrase. We are living in the time of the end, a time crowded with events in process of fulfillment. So now going to relay these events all working to bring about that great day when Christ shall be revealed in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The last years of probation are fast closing. The signs of the times, the wars and rumours of wars. So she, she says that the signs that tell them that they're at the time of the end is the wars and rumours of wars. The strikes, murders, robberies and accidents tell us that the end of all things is at hand. Right? So when you see... The shaking of the earth, which is these the, 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 the wars and rumours of wars taking place, is telling you, this is the sign, that the coming of Christ is near at hand, but it's not yet, right? It's pointing down to the end. This is the shaking of the earth, not the shaking of the heavens and the earth. Uh, <clears throat> Who can doubt the truth of the prophet's words? The wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. Many of the inhabitants of the world have given themselves into Satan's control. They cooperate with him, helping him to carry out his plans against the government of God. Under his guidance, men have lost their horror of bloodshed and murder. Okay, so the signs that tell us that we're at the time of the end is this wars and rumours of wars. And it's caused by the Sunday law that they, they make. That's what 21st of February 1848 shows us. So when they make that Sunday law, the nations rise up. Okay. The south comes against the north. Next quote. We are living in the time of the end. Right. This is from Review and Herald, December 15th, 1904. 
begins the same way. Thrones and churches have united to oppose God's purposes. So what's come together? Thrones and churches. That's church and state. The association of man with man, which God designed should be a means of strengthening goodness and happiness, is used as a means of strengthening evil and of developing tendencies to rebellion. Men have assumed despotic power and human laws have been put in the place of the law of God. It is the reign of Antichrist. Okay, Antichrist is the man of sin. And we know right here when the Sunday law is made that the deadly wound is healed. But prophecy tells us that that the, the man of sin, right, when you, when you understand this, but the woman, Jezebel and Herodias, there's this uh, conflict taking place, but they're not there. You don't see them. But this is why Second Thessalonians says, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Because although he's there, the threefold unions come together, the Sunday laws in place, you won't recognize that it's been done by the papacy. But right here, it's going to be revealed. Okay, and hence then you have this reign for 1260. Um, <clears throat> so, the time of the end is the Sunday law. It's the shaking of the earth. The signs is the, the, the wars and rumours of wars prefigured by uh, February 21st, 1848. Okay, important that we see that. But at the same time, I also want to show you now that the four winds are held. So when we go to Education 179, paragraph 1, it says, The final overthrow of all earthly dominions is plainly foretold in the word of truth. In the prophecy uttered when sentence from God was pronounced upon the last king of Israel is given the message. Thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem, take off the crown, exalt him that is low, and abase him that is high. I will overturn, 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 and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. The crown removed from Israel passed successively to the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. God says it shall be no more until he come whose right it is and I will give it him. So she begins in saying the final overthrow of earthly dominions is plainly foretold in the word of truth. And she parallels it to the, the four kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome, which is the head, the body, the waist and the feet. Okay, Or the lion, the bear, the leopard and the dragon. It's, uh, it's, it's important that, that we understand that, right? So she's saying that this represents the final overthrow of all earthly kingdoms. And she says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn until he comes who's right it is. And Christ comes in the time of the fourth. And in my last presentation, we are putting in place that the same time that Christ, the true Christ, comes in the time of pagan Rome, Antichrist also comes in the time of pagan Rome. It's this little horn that pops up and reveals himself. The papacy, the, 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 or should I say, this woman is a, is a doctrine, is a spiritual woman, but here under the papacy, you now have this literal church that sits on top of the nations, right? So it manifests itself in the flesh, just like Christ when he came the first time, he manifested himself in the flesh. And it's typifying the end of the world when Christ is going to manifest himself in the flesh through his people that, that believe him. The, uh, uh, divinity and humanity will be combined. Whereas this is uh, Satan and humanity c combined, right? Just as Judas left the table, okay, uh, uh, and as soon as he left that table, Satan entered into him and possessed him. He's the son of perdition. Likewise, Satan is going to manifest himself through the Pope, right, is going to, Antichrist is going to claim that Christ has come through the Pope. And in this time period, if you bow down in worship, you're bowing down in worship in Satan. And you're going to receive the mark of the beast. So, and then it says in this next paragraph, that time is at hand. That time when this kingdom is going to be set up is at hand right here. Today the signs of the times declare that we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. So it's talking about signs, right? Everything in our world is in agitation. Before our eyes is fulfilling the Saviour's prophecy of the events to precede his coming. He shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Same signs, right? So it's the time of the end and it's marking the shaking of the earth. And it's marking this time when the final overthrow of all earthly dominions is 
been mild. The rise of this statue at the end of the world. And Sister White marks that golden statue in Daniel chapter 3 at the Sunday Law. So, continue reading. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy a position of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place around us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that has taken possession of every earthly element. And they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife, that they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the four winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. So, he's telling us that the four winds are being held here. But, um, <clears throat> but a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. And we know that at the second woe, this is the first woe, the four winds are loosed. Now it's important that we understand this fractal. Let's look up here. Because what I, what I want us to understand is that between midnight B and uh, oh, midnight B and midnight C right here. Let me never put it on there. Th this right here is this right here. You have this illustration because <clears throat> This was prefigured by, you know, Moses coming before Pharaoh, and you have the, the ten plagues of Egypt. That's what, why it's, it's in here. It's also marking the first temple cleansing. When Christ began his public ministry. It's also marking the, the first disappointment on, uh, on April 19th, 1844. It's also marking the first separation in 2014, hence I've put it there. So you have these, these ten plagues, and the first three come upon everybody, but then you have this finger of God where there's a separation takes place and the last seven only come upon the Egyptians. It comes up to the tenth plague uh, <coughs> where they get delivered, right? And they get delivered out of Egypt, right? So that has been placed in there, right? And, <coughs> it, and what it is is this right here is prefiguring this, this up here, and we will, we'll, we'll see that in a moment, because here you have the seven last plagues, and, which is the, the time of Jacob's trouble, and here you have the, the little time of Jacob's trouble. And what I need us to understand is that this number one here is representing this. Okay, this first group of people is getting dealt with here, second group of people, third group of people. So in a bigger sense, you have this represented right here. He will overturn, overturn, overturn. And now you have the fourth. This is the perfect kingdom at the end of the world where they make this death decree at the close of probation, right? And then the Lord punishes this, this last kingdom. And that's what's been prefigured here. I will overturn, overturn, overturn. And now you have the fourth reigning for this time period, right? So when the Lord looses the four winds right here, it's typifying the seven last plagues that are poured out. And it's beginning right here at the chasm upon those that despised the, the, the message that, that comes right here. And we understand this is where the, these false shepherds are going to get smitten. Okay, And now I've got 2016 there, but that's where this began. And when this prophecy is understood and it comes to pass, that's where that midnight cry message will really go forward with power. Because when this event takes place, everybody will sit up and pay attention, right? And then it will sweep away all this fanaticism. So 2014, 2016, Midnight A and uh, Midnight A is, is in type. It's, there's no Sunday law then, and it's prefigured Midnight B, Chasm to Midnight C, where, you know, where this beast is going to manifest itself. But nonetheless... We have the Omega apostasy taking place now in type right here, and the Lord is going to deal with it. Because when we repeat this history and go through it again, we will have no excuse because we are not to forget our past history, right? So we're, the Lord is running us through it now and preparing us 
uh, for what's coming. And I just want to understand that the four winds are held here, uh, marking the beginning of the first woe, but right here at the end of the first woe, the four winds are loosed. And it's marking, or this four winds being loosed here, is prefiguring these seven last plagues. So, uh, <clears throat> it says, The Bible and the Bible only gives a correct view of these things. Here are revealed the great final scenes in the history of our world. Events that already are casting their shadows before the sound of their approaching approach, causing the earth to tremble and men's hearts to fail them for fear. So, next quote. Uh, now she's going to talk about the Sabbath in this next quote, and she's talking about it in the year 1847, one year, or a few months really, before 1848, where this event here was prefigured. This view was given in 1847, when there were but very few of Advent brethren observing the Sabbath, and of these, but few supposed that its observing was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfilment of that view is beginning to be seen. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plagues shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. So it says there, the nations are angry, yet held in check. And it says, at that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come. And as we read in the second Advent uh, movement, that they understood when this took, event took place, that it was time for the sealing message, the latter rain message. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues will be poured out. So what's going to happen here is that Revelation 18 angel that's marking this first temple cleansing comes and prepares you, right, for this time period here, right? And that's important. We, we've not understood this uh, as well as we should have done before, but we see that the... the the period here, this period when it comes, is preparing you for the chasm, for this final test when it, when it comes. So, um, so she's saying that when this comes here, it's not the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a, a period that comes a short while before. So on both fractals, here you have the time of Jacob's trouble. Short period before is from point B leading down the close of probation and it's been prefigured right by midnight B to the chasm to midnight C. Christ object lessons 412 which is at the chasm which is the midnight cry tells us that the final test comes at the close of human probation so it's telling you Luke 11 tells us that the door is shut there some people's probation closes right there. They immediately reject the message and bang, it shuts. Seven last plagues begin uh, to pour out on the despisers, in, in type, obviously. And it's marking a progressive down to, to, the, uh, to the end where he says it's done. And the other day we were going through uh, the seven last plagues, and you can just look at that, just just for effect, if we go to Revelation 16, just so we can understand this point. In verse 17, it says, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. So when the seventh angel, when the seventh uh, plagues poured out, he says, It is done. Right? And we know that if you, if you take that, and bring it down here, it's marking a point where it is done, right? But you've got a closed door here for some people, and it's progressive all the way down to the fact he says it's done. And this is Matthew 25 and verse 10, the closed door. So there's two closed doors from here to here, showing this progressive door closing from all the people all the way down. Um, many ways we can show that. Um, so... Um, 
I saw that the shaking of the powers in Europe is not as some teach the shaking of the powers of heaven, but it's the shaking of the angry nations. So the shaking of the earth is the shaking of the angry nations. The nations are angry, yet held in check. So it's not to prevent the work of the third angel. So third angel, Revelation 18, it's the latter rain message. It's parallel to Revelation 10. It's the sealing message, and the sealing message begins right there. So let's now bring some other thoughts together. So we just put in place there that the four winds are held. So let's read a quote in reference to those four winds from CET 102. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed in priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands and with a loud, sorry, with a voice of deep pity cried, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel fly with a commission from Jesus, swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do in the earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, Hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. So you have these four kingdoms here. Hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. So although... This chaos begins to happen here. It's still in a measure. It's held, right? It's, it's only been allowed to do certain things. Same as you have this here under the first woe, okay? And, and we will look at that shortly when we, we come to it. Um, and if we go to Revelation 7, right, which this is, is referring to, Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3, it says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their forehead. So the restraint... Although the, 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 there's chaos and all that going on here, the restraint is hurt not, right? That given a command, hurt not the earth, the sea, or the trees until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead, right? Very important to understand. So <clears throat> hold, 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 hold until the servants of God are sealed. So there's a sealing process going on in here while these things are being hold. But right here, they're going to be loosed. So we, we have to understand what is that teaching us. So in Maranatha uh, 2.43, it says, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Everything in the world is in, is in an unsettled state. The nations are angry, right here. And great preparations for war are being made. Nation is plotting against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So it says that the, it's marking Revelation 7 right here, the four winds being held when the nations are angry, and nation is plotting against nation. The great day of God is hasting greatly, but although the nations are mustering their forces for war and bloodshed, the command to the angel is still in force that they hold the four winds until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. As yet the four winds are held until the servants of God shall be sealed in their foreheads. Then the powers of earth will marshal their forces for the last great battle. How carefully we should improve the little remaining period of our probation. <laughs> Profound this, right? But we, we will clear some thoughts up in a moment. So everything is held here until the servants of God are sealed. So it's telling us that somehow in this time period here, the servants of God have to be sealed. So when they get here and those four winds are loose, you have to be sealed. But we also know that this is the investigative judgment where you're being sealed. So how do you marry up these two thoughts? Well, you will see very easy, quickly as we go through. Now, we just read there that uh, <clears throat> it says that, that, that then the powers of the earth will marshal their forces for the last great battle. 
The last great battle is taking place in the seven last plagues. This is where they make this death decree and go forward to kill God's people and the Lord does not allow it to happen, right? It's the, it's the last great battle. It's been typified uh, here in this time period in the midnight cry because there's this last warning message uh, got to go in this time period. You've been tested in this time period whether or not you will give this message or whether or not you will flee away. So, um, and just a point to make as we're on that thought, in in Revelation 16, in the, the, the chapter about the seven last plagues, it says, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Now, it's always been a mystery. Why, why is that verse in there? Okay, uh, It says, um, uh, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, right, right here at the chasm. And here it's saying, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, we know at the beginning you, you've got this garment and you have to keep it spotless. And it's saying here, uh, <coughs> Blessed is he that watcheth, right? Now, the, 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 the triumphal entry, the message is, Blessed is he, uh, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Okay? So you, you have this. Uh, behold, the bridegroom cometh, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And here it says, Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth. It's the same message, it's this last warning message that's prefigured in the seven last plagues that are in type leading down to the close of probation right here. Uh, these fractals are, are, are very uh, profound. So, there's no message given in the, the literal falling of the seven last plagues. So you have to ask yourself, what's it doing in there? Well, it's showing you that when these seven last plagues are being prefigured here, when these four winds are loosed, right, there's this last one and message goes before the, the door shuts there and Christ comes, which is the latter rain. Okay, because you've got Revelation 18, 1 to 3 here, and you've got Revelation 18, 4 and 5 here, right? So you've got the latter rain there, the latter rain there. You've got Pentecost there, Pentecost here. You've got a birth there, you've got a birth here. You have a temple cleansing there, you have a temple cleansing here. You have a... Um, and we're going to show you that there's a ceiling takes place here and there's a ceiling takes place here. It's, it, it's, it's all the same thing. When Christ began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple for the first time. He was announcing his work right there to cleanse the heart of the, of the human heart of defilement. And he did it for three years, for the whole length of the time. So really it's shown one work that, that begins right here and it culminates right here. But it's important that we see that there's two phases. So the command is given in the first woe, right? And the command is to hurt not, right? Hurt not the, the um, <clears throat> what did it say? The earth, the sea, or the trees. Now, if we go to Revelation 9, which is the first woe, in verse 4, there's also given a command to, to the, 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 this, this angel right there. And it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt, or they hurt not, the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So there's a command given, the same command as here, heart not, right? It was to heart not the, the, um, the sea, the trees, or the earth, right? And here they were not to heart the, the earth, the green thing, or the tree. It's, it's a practically... A practically identical message, right? Hurt not uh, the, the earth and the trees are both the same. The other one is the sea and, and, and the green thing. But you can see the, the very much the similarities with the message. And when you have them parallel in each other, Revelation 7 and, and Revelation 9, you can see that it's the same message, the same command to hurt not. Um, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. So if they're told to hurt not, 
um, and they're only to because they're to torment, if they're only to torment those that do not have the seal, then they must be able to identify somebody who has a seal. And that's what we have to look at here. And you'll see it very clearly. Uh, now in Revelation 9.11, right, it says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. Now, when you go look those up, you have Abaddon equals it means destroying angel. Apollyon means the destroyer. And both these are attributed to Satan. He's this star that, that falls from heaven there in Revelation 9.1. is the angel at the bottomless pit. So the command is given to Satan to hurt not. Hurt not these things, but only those people that have not the seal of God in their forehead. So he must be able to identify who has the seal. Now, now let's read. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. It says, In, in whom ye also trusted, that after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So, when you, when you believe the truth, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, right? So it's a promise you're sealed with. And it says it's the earnest, which is a down payment. So it's a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption. So when you're sealed with this Holy Spirit of promise, it's a down payment until the redemption. So redemption is sometime in the future, right? So we want to read now what Sister White says about Ephesians uh, 1 and verse 13. This, this Holy Spirit, this seal of promise. It says, she quotes Ephesians 1.13. What is the seal of the living God, which is placed in the foreheads of his people? It is a mark which angels, but not human eyes, can read. For the destroying angel must see this mark of redemption. Right. So he's told to hurt not only those people that, that do not have the seal. Therefore, he can see those people that have the seal. It says the destroying angel must see this mark of redemption. It's a promise of redemption, and he cannot hurt you. He can't touch you. He's only to torment, right? He's not to hurt anybody, but he's only to torment, but only those people that have not the seal of God, right? So, what's telling us right here, the angel of Revelation 18, when it comes down, you get sealed with a promise, and it's a mark on your forehead that... The angels can see and know that you belong to Christ. It's a, it's a promise and it's a down payment of your redemption which is to come. And we'll see this very clearly. But when you go to the next paragraph, it's going to talk about a different part of the ceiling. In Four Bible Commentary, it says, The angel with the writer's inkhorn is to place a mark upon the foreheads of all who are separated from sin and sinners. And the destroying angel follows this angel. Now, very important, if you go to Ezekiel 9, very clear to distinguish between these two uh, things, because right here he's told to hurt not. But in Ezekiel 9, it begins in verse 1, it says, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice. Right? And you can show very, very simply that it's right here. They're now giving this midnight cry message. The man with the writer's ink on goes through the, 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 the city and begins to seal people, right? And the, 
The five men with the, the, the slaughter weapons, which Sister Wise says is the destroying angel, right? It's a, it's a combination of God's people who are given a message and Satan through Islam that are slaying the people because Christ and the midnight cry was sitting on the ass. So you've got Christ controlling the ass. He's given the commands, the ass is obeying him. Hence, you know, the four winds are loosed, but they're also, they're only doing what he allows them to do. Right here, hurt not, but you can torment only those people that have not the seal of God in their forehead. Right here, Christ is sitting on the ass, showing you this relationship between his people in Islam. And uh, right here in Revelation 9 in the second war, they're allowed to kill. Okay, it's changed. The four ones are loose, they can now kill. And the, the five men with the slaughter weapons, when they go through that city, they are slaying, right? That's not hurt not. It's a different portion of time, right? So, I'll read it again. It says, The angel with the writer's ink on is to place a mark upon the foreheads of all who are separated from sin and sinners, right? When the, the 12 disciples go forward here. Judas is still amongst them. So they're not separated from sin and sinners. That doesn't take place till here. When characters reveal two classes are separated. And those that begin to sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the land. The angel with the writer's income goes through and seals them. This is them receiving the promise. Promise given. Promise fulfilled. This is when it's, it's finished. Right? But it's a progressive thing that goes on down through this time period in this final test. Next paragraph. She now quotes Revelation 7, which we've already put here. It says, Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their forehead. And, and she explains, It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as the people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is, a, what is coming. So the judgments that are coming on the land is here, and they tell us what is coming. It's the sign that says, when this comes, you know what is coming. And it's, and it's telling us that um, just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. So it's talking about a shaking that's going to come, but yet it's begun already. Right? Shaking of the earth begins here. Shaking of the heavens and the earth be begins here. This is this 25 years that's cut short. If you look in Bible history, this is where the signs of the shaking of the heavens and the earth began, right? You have the, the dark day, the, the, or the, the, the Lisbon earthquake, then, then it was followed by the, the dark day, the blood moon, etc., etc., leading down to stars falling from heaven. These were the signs that were given, that were telling you that the, the advent of Christ was right upon us, right? So the first sign is telling you that it's nigh at hand. Second signs begin to happen. It's right upon us, which is right here. So, uh, <clears throat> when you, um, so that you, you got these two shakings. So, <clears throat> it's not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. So, when you understand this, this says the shaking's already begun. You're now settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that you cannot be moved when you get here. Because as soon as they're sealed in their forehead, right, it's the seal that only angels can see it's going to come. So in this short period here, there's a sealing taking place. And once that sealing is, is complete, it's going to bring this shaken to see if they're going to stand. And... Um, <clears throat> And I, I will prove that to you as we go through, and you'll see it, it's very clear. Because she, she likens Revelation 7 here, and we've already shown Revelation 7 comes here. Hold the four winds until the servants of God are sealed. Then the four winds are loosed. So you've got these two witnesses. Revelation 7 says, hold until the sealed loose. 
So the sealing has to take place in this time period. And we see here, it's a settling into the truth, intellectually and spiritually, they cannot be moved. As soon as they're sealed, the shaking's going to come. Indeed, it has already begun. Right? So you've got to follow those things very closely. But right here, those four winds are going to be loosed. And there's going to be a shaking. So let's read about the shaking. And Sister White speaks on it. You can see very clearly that it's this time period here. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. Evil angels crowded around, pressing darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view, that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them, and thus be led to distrust God and murmur against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upwards. Angels of God had charge over his people, and as the poisonous atmosphere of evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness. So, the man with the writer's ink on, he's going through and putting a, 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 a sign or, or a seal upon the foreheads of those that are sighing and crying. And here, this is what's taking place here. And we read there right at the beginning, uh, large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. And we know that at the chasm, James White, when he's about to cross that chasm, there's large drops of perspiration falling from his forehead. It was all marking the, the Garden of Gethsemane, this test that Christ is having there. It says, As the praying ones continued their earnest cries, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenances. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil, uh, the evil angels, and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels, uh, but his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. I asked the meaning of the shaking. I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony, called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking amongst God's people. So, shaking of the earth, shaking of the heavens and the earth. External, right? Internally, shaking is caused here, but when the message comes, right, that people will rise up against it and cause a shaking. And that's what happened exactly right there. And it's just still ticking over until it's going to be um, perfectly fulfilled when, when they get smitten. Next quote from CET 81. In later years I have been shown that the false theories advanced in the past have, no me have by no means been given up. As favourable opportunities come, they will have a resurrection. Let us not forget that everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. So it's speaking about false theories being resurrected. The enemy will be successful in overthrowing the faith of some, but those who are true to principle will not be shaken. They will stand firm amid trial and temptation. So this is the time where you've got to stand firm amidst this trial and temptation. The Lord has pointed out these errors and those who do not discern where Satan has come in will continue to be led in false paths. Jesus bids us be watchful and strengthen the things that remain which are ready to die. We are not called upon to enter into controversy with those who hold false theories. Controversy is unprofitable. Christ never entered into it. It is written, is the weapon used by the world's redeemer. 
Let us keep close to the word. Let us allow the Lord Jesus and his messengers to testify. We know that their testimony is true. So right here, you to give the message. Don't in, enter into controversy. Just give it. Thus saith the Lord. Satan writes, Christ in the wilderness for 40 years. Satan came down and tested him three times. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And that is to be our, um, our answer. And that's what she said there. It is written. Now, if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, which she also links to Ephesians chapter 1, showing us the same thing. We, we just read through this and i just show you the same point. In verse 17, it says, <clears throat> This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So this is this, this is conversion it's talking about. So when you're converted, you don't act like you acted before in the old world. You put those things away and you walk forward as a new man. Now remember, there's two births, one here and one here. I'm going to show that this, what it's speaking about, is this one here. It's very easy to see. It says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So it says, you're, when you have this conversion, you're sealed unto the day of re redemption. It's something that's in the future. It's this promise given of redemption, and the promise is going to be fulfilled r right here, when Christ blots out your sin. And we, we will see that clearer as we, we go through. Now, I just want to make this point here. I just want to put in place what is the gift of God, right? So in John 4, 10, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee a living water. So the gift of God is the living water, right? It's the, it's the latter rain. Because Christ says, when he's at the Feast of Tabernacles, those that come unto me, I will give the, uh, out, out of your belly will come rivers of living water. And Christ on the cross, when he, when he said it is done, the, the Roman soldier pierced his belly, and out of his belly came these rivers of living water, right? It's the, it's the latter rain. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 20, it says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. This is what the, the, the Pharisees did. They thought they could buy Christ for 30 pieces of silver, right? And it's, it's uh, foolishness, right? You can't, you can't buy. It's all something spiritual. So <clears throat> the gift of God uh, uh, in, in this sense was the Holy Spirit, right? This was this magician who, who, who wanted to buy what they had from him, right? So two witnesses there showing you that, that it, it's the, the Holy Spirit. But in, verse, in, sorry, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 22 it says, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have to understand, when you receive this latter rain, you have eternal life. Okay, But this... Right here, this seal is a promise. And 
it's not guaranteed. It's up to you whether you fulfill the promise, right? You've got to get here or you've got to go through this test to receive the promise. And it's very, very clear. Because it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And we, we shown this is speaking about the papacy. Right? The, the, the falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. So the place where the falling away takes place is where the man of sin is revealed. Right? Characters revealed at the, at the midnight cry. Tears are revealed here. Okay? The foolish virgins. All marking the point that is going to bring about a revelation of character. The, the wheat and tears, the seed is sown here. And right here it begins to bud and bring forth fruit. So, the falling away, right? So, <clears throat> let's, let's understand now. So, you receive this, this promise given, but there's going to be a falling away here. Some people that have received this promise, right, are going to fall away here and they're going to lose that promise. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, a taste is like, a, it's like an earnest, it's like a down payment. A taste is like, oh, there's a whole cake there, you want to eat the whole cake, but no, you just get a little taste. That cake is waiting for you, right? Oh, I just want to taste it in advance. It says, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come. So it's something future that they're tasting. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them, for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. And is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labour of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It's the patience of the saints, right? You've got to have faith and patience to the end to inherit the promise. But it tells you, that, so there's a foretaste here, there's a falling away here, and the promise is fulfilled. Okay, and it says right here that, that many are going to be deceived uh, right here. So it's important that we understand this. So now we're going to read this last quote and then we'll summarize the, the whole thing. This is the fulfillment of the promise. So it's speaking about Joshua, the high priest, who's, who's weeping and howling and praying for his people in this, this, this time period right here. It says, as the people of God afflict their souls before him, pleading for purity of heart, the command is given, take away the filthy garments. And as we've done in other studies, the filthy garments represent the accusations that Satan throws upon God's people. They, they cover them with all these filthy garments, accusations, and try to make them look bad, but God is going to vindicate them. The command is given, take away the filthy garments, and the encouraging words are spoken. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Now, when you come to the, the, the marriage supper at midnight, you have to have the wedding garment on, right? This is the point. 
You've already got the wedding garment here. You come here and now you're throwing all these filthy garments on you. They're the four, throwing these um, accusations at you. But at the end, Christ says, take away the filthy garments and he gives you a garment. Why is he giving you a garment if you've already got one? It's because this is the earnest. It's the, the beginning of the work, right? You've got to go all the way to the end, keeping your garment spotless, that he will give you the promise at the end. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. The spotless robe of Christ's righteousness is placed upon the tried, tempted, and faithful children of God. Tried, tempted, and faithful. The despised remnant are clothed in glorious apparel, never more to be defiled by the corruptions of the world. Never more. It's finished. Their names are retained in the Lamb's Book of Life, enrolled among the faithful of all ages. They have resisted the wiles of the deceiver. They have not been turned from their loyalty by the dragon's roar. Now they are eternally secure from the tempter's devices. Their sins are transferred to the originator of sin. A fair mitre is set upon their heads. They get this crown. While Satan has been urging his accusations, holy angels unseen have been passing to and fro, placing upon the faithful ones the seal of the living God. These are they that stand upon Mount Zion with the Lamb having the Father's name written in their foreheads. They sing the new song before the throne, that song which no man can learn save the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And the first fruits are marked here because you have this three days, right? Christ is crucified. Okay, rests on the Sabbath and he rises again the third day. It's this resurrection that takes place here and that day was first fruits. Okay, so it's very easy to see when you go through this that the sealing is a two-step process but it's, it's, it's not something different. It's the same seal. It's just, it's something that's put on your forehead that you, the only angels can see, right? And it's a foretaste of what you're going to get here. So Revelation 18, 1 to 3 is a foretaste of Revelation 18, 4 and 5. It's basically how you can simply understand that. But there's going to be a falling away here. Many people who receive this right here are going to fall away. And it warns you in Hebrews chapter 6, it's impossible again to be renewed unto repentance if you fall away here. We must understand that right now. And that's been prefigured right here. These people who... <laughs> They turn from the truth, they rise up, cause a shaking, and what do they do? They begin to accuse their brethren, throwing the dirty garments upon their brethren and causing many people to turn away. They did not want to enter in themselves and they prevent others from doing so. It's been prefigured. It's saying it's impossible for them to be renewed unto repentance. Impossible. And therefore the Lord is going to smite them, right? The Lord is going to smite those shepherds and this last one message will go to that flock. And we aim to lay out this theme over the next few weeks um, as much as possible. So I pray that this will bless you. Please study it out. Make sure that you understand it. Um, let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, your word is sure. Lord, we cannot get round it. It's terrible. That's why it says in the Bible, you are the, the, <clears throat> the terrible and dreadful God. And I pray, Lord, that we are not on the wrong side of uh, your anger, but rather, Lord, that we humble ourselves before you now while we still have time, confess our sins and realize our great need and put away our pride and our foolishness and all this vanity, all these false messages and all this uh, fanaticisms that are being promoted and people making so many excuses for it instead of just following God's word. Instead, they want to follow human beings and so much accusations and so much confusion going around. 
And the devil is doing a, a masterly work in this. And I pray, Lord, that your people would shine through all of this and the, 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 the truth would be seen amongst all the darkness. And I know that this will happen because your word says it. And I pray, Lord, that many people out there would see that and turn from the darkness and turn to the truth. And I pray that you will save us, Lord, and help us because we are weak and sinful and we so badly need to be saved. So please help us to put our trust in thee and to wait upon thee and prepare for what's about to come upon us, we pray. And we thank you and ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.